my dear, dear students, colleagues, and all the viewers who are watching this program live from Facebook page Physics Atta. I'd like to welcome you all to our, our international physics webinar. So today it's our uh, 30th webinar. Uh, good, good afternoon to all. Hope you are well and safe from Corona pandemic. So all we know that we are staying in a Corona pandemic situation. And uh, as uh, we cannot uh, uh, continue our normal uh, academic program uh, in, in, in our institution, so we have to start our online program. So our department, Department of Physics, uh, have already started some online program, like uh, online classes and online international physics webinar. So we are actually uh, in a situation, uh, the, the new experience all of we are having, because uh, we, we, we have to uh, follow some rules, uh, health, health, health rules and something. So this is new normal, and we are trying our best to adjust with this new normal. And uh, we have arranged the series of online uh, webinar, physics webinar, and, uh, and in those uh, uh, physics webinar, physicists from different countries are uh, coming as a main speaker, and they deliver their speech, and they, they share their experience, they share their knowledge with our student. And by this way, I think students uh, uh, have benefited so this is the, uh, the uh, their, uh, I, th I think for a student, it's an opportunity to interact with a famous physicist. The aim of our webinar is to actually motivate our student and to encourage them in this corona pandemic situation. So I'm, I'm happy to share with you all that. Uh, we have uh, successfully completed uh, 29th webinar and today is our 30th webinar. And I'd like to thanks all for, a, for all of your support and uh, encouragement in this, uh, in this, uh, by in, in this regard. So today, I'd like to welcome you all to a joint session between Pabna University of Science and Technology, Pabna Bangladesh, and Istanbul Technical University, Istanbul, Turkey, in higher energy physics and astrophysics. And we have with us here today, Dr. Karim Yavuz Aksi, Professor, Department of Physics Engineering, Istanbul Technical University, Faculty of Science and Letters. Uh, Istanbul, Turkey, joining us from Turkey, and he has already connected with us. So I'd like to welcome him. So good afternoon, sir. And good welcome, afternoon. Yeah, welcome to our uh, webinar and welcome to our university and Bangladesh. Um, I thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm going to be introducing you uh, some of the uh, most interesting objects. Uh, uh, they are called neutron stars. Uh, they are called uh, sometimes superstars of nature. I'll explain why. Um, first, I'd like you. I'd like to introduce you my group of uh, students here. I'm the only astrophysicist in the department, and um, this is our laboratory. Uh, and uh, we have a computer down here, and nothing else. Uh, but we have very enthusiastic students. They are very good. And so we have no excuse for doing uh, good science. Uh, so um, I call this Pines theorem. Uh, David Pines in 1990 in a, a conference, uh, he suggested that neutron stars are superstars. Why is he calling them superstars? Here is the proof. They are born in supernova explosions. Uh, they are super dense objects. The density reaches somewhat like 10 to the 15 grams per centimeter cube. Uh, they can attain super spin frequencies. For example, they can rotate about a thousand times about their uh, rotational axis. And Oh, okay, uh, they are super precise clocks. That means um, you can predict. I mean, they are better than uh, better best atomic clocks we can devise uh, on the Earth, and they contain neutrons in a super fluid state in their crust, and. They have the protons in a superconducting state, again, inside and in the crust. And they can experience superquicks if you are to compare it with the Richter 
uh, scale, they, they are experiencing somewhat like 17 uh, Richter magnitude quakes. And neutron stars can have super strong magnetic fields. Typically, they would have a magnetic field about 10 to the 8 Tesla, but some of them can have 10 to the 11 Tesla of magnetic fields, which is beyond the quantum critical limit. Uh, and they are super uh, accelerators. Uh, so their magnetosphere rotating so rapidly uh, with uh, so, uh, so strong magnetic fields, it would be a very good site for accelerating particles uh, to super high energies. So let's review some facts about neutron stars. Uh, a typical neutron star would have a mass about 1.4 solar masses or somewhat higher, up to 2 or 2.5 solar masses. We don't know the maximum possible limit, actually. Uh, it would be about 2.5. Uh, on the other side, they would be very small objects. Uh, they, they would have a radius about uh, 10 to 15 kilometers. The best estimate today is about 11 kilometers. So, given these two numbers, you can estimate the average density of a neutron star. It would be about 10 to the 15 grams per centimeter cube, which is uh, beyond the density of nuclear matter on the Earth. And as I told you, the magnetic fields can be typically uh, 10 to the 8 Tesla, which is equal to 10 to the 12 Gauss. Uh, but some of those uh, neutron stars, which we call uh, magnetars, um, they have magnetic fields even exceeding this super high fields. Um, so they would have magnetic fields about 10 to the 15 Gauss, which is equal to 10 to the 11 Tesla. And they would uh, show some bizarre phenomena. So for example, they would explode. Uh, they would uh, show explosions um, where the magnetic field lines reconnect and uh, these explosions would reach energies uh, like 10 to the uh, 46 Hertz per second. We call these giant flares. One of those happened in 2004, uh, December 2004, and, uh, and then uh, it caused some ionization at the outer layers of our atmosphere. Uh, while the object was already 50,000 light years away. If the object was only 50 light years away, then our atmosphere would be blown apart. I mean, it would just, you know, evaporate. Uh, so why are neutron stars important? Uh, are they related to fundamental physics somehow? Yes. Uh, we don't know the uh, ground state of uh, this dense matter. So understanding the ground state of dense matter is an important aspect of fundamental physics. And of course, another uh, thing related to neutron stars would be that they would have very strong gravitational fields so you might like to uh, test Einstein's relativity with uh, neutron stars. Yet another aspect, ah, well, here you see uh, two objects, for example, two neutron stars rotating about each other. According to Einstein's general relativity, this system uh, would lose orbital energy and approach each other uh, while emitting gravitational waves. 
and that is uh, uh, how they would uh, do this according to uh, general relativity and it was tested by Hulse and Taylor in uh, 1974 and they were given the Nobel Prize in uh, 1983 and more recently we have witnessed the merger of two neutron stars that have approached each other in this way by releasing uh, gravitational waves for a long time. So the final stage happens very rapidly and it is observed as a uh, gamma ray burst. And associated with the gamma ray burst is the emission of gravitational waves, which were detected in 2016. Uh, very recently, and that was also awarded the uh, Nobel Prize. Another aspect of uh, neutron stars related to fundamental physics is the superfluidity in them. Well, uh, on the Earth, in terrestrial conditions, you can produce superfluidity only with uh, helium, right? You would uh, just uh, cool the helium below the lambda point to obtain the superfluidity of helium because helium is the only element that remains fluid at such uh, cold temperatures. Uh, well, in neutron stars, uh, neutrons uh, would be in a superfluid state. And as you well know, a superfluid cannot rotate and it forms um, these vortices uh, to keep uh, or to conserve the angular momentum, right? So the sum of the uh, angular momentum of the vortices would be equal to the total angular momentum of the neutron stars. So these vortices would be uh, moving uh, inside a neutron star and they uh, lead to interesting observational phenomena, which we call the glitches, which are the jumps in the spin periods. So, oh, how do they form? How do the neutron stars form? Um, as you well know, there are three possible end products of stellar evolution. Uh, and these are all compact objects. Uh, what whichever a uh, whichever a star will evolve into depends on the mass of the progenitor, the chemical composition of it, and the angular momentum. Uh, so, if uh, small mass objects, you know, they evolve into white dwarfs at the end of their lives. Uh, objects with masses. Uh, in the mediocre range, like three to eight solar masses, they would evolve into neutron stars. And the most massive objects are expected to evolve into black holes. Here you see a supernova remnant. Uh, and this is the dead of a massive star which lived some time ago. Uh, it was observed as a supernova explosion uh, in uh, Adonis uh, 1054. That means after Christ 1054, Chinese astronomers uh, registered this event as a guest star. So they didn't know it was a supernova explosion. And actually, they have been observing such objects uh, occasionally, and they have registered them as guest stars because they would appear in the night sky. They would be there for a few months, and then they would disappear or decline gradually. So they were why they're calling these uh, guest stars. And in the 20th century, we have understood that, uh, you know, 
uh, they are associated with neutron stars. They are associated with the birth events of neutron stars. So uh, in the beginning, I told you the neutron stars are born in supernova explosions. That means when the nuclear uh, reactions in a star end, and you finally have an iron core, uh, you don't have any place to go by nuclear reactions because iron is the most stable of the elements. So uh, you cannot generate energy. What happens is that the iron core collapses to form the neutron star while the outer la layers are ejected with this huge explosion that we call the supernova explosion. Actually, lots of neutrinos are emitted. 99% of the energy is emitted in the form of neutrinos. And what we see as a supernova in, in the optical is just a tiny fraction of the total energy emitted. So at the center of this nebula, we have discovered a pulsar, and which means it's a neutron star, which are showing pulsations uh, because uh, each time it rotates, the magnetic pole aligns with our line of sight and we see a pulse. Okay, so there's nothing pulsating actually. It's just rotating and there's a, a magnetic pole which we can see and if this pole is passing from our line of sight, we see a pulse. So these pulses were discovered uh, from a neutron star right at the center of this crab nebula. So we know the exact date of this uh, because Chinese have registered this as a guest star. Uh, now the neutron star at the center is rotating with a period of 33 milliseconds. So it's rotating 30 times about itself. And it is slowing down at a slow pace, uh, 4.22 times 10 to the minus 13 seconds per second. So it's about um, microseconds in a year. So it's slowing down and we can measure it because measuring time is very easy in astrophysics. Um, and these objects are very good clocks. Actually, we can me measure the period of this object uh, up to a precision of 10 digits. Um, so this is slowing down and all this energy emitted by the neutron star is actually the conversion of this kinetic energy, rotational kinetic energy of the neutron star to electromagnetic radiation. So this is the spin down power minus I omega, omega dot is the rotational power of this object. Omega is the angular frequency and omega dot is its rate of change. So if you plug in the numbers uh, from the periods, okay, two pi over P is the omega, all right, then you can convert P dot as well to omega dot. Uh, you would get a luminosity like 10 to the five times the solar luminosity. So look at this. The object is slowing down at a rate of microseconds in a year, but this is still corresponding to a huge power, which is exceeding the nuclear power of the sun by five orders of magnitude. So why are they slowing down? Uh, because a rotating object, a magnetized rotating object, uh, of which the rotation axis and the magnetic axis are not aligned, uh, it would emit um, energy by magnetic dipole radiation. So uh, the magnetic dipole uh, model 
uh, says that the rotational power would be proportional to the angular velocity to the fourth, right? And so mu here is the magnetic dipole moment and alpha is the inclination angle between the rotation and the magnetic axis. So there is a torque acting on the neutron star uh, due to this magnetic dipole radiation. And actually you can uh, see uh, how they are uh, slowing down. You can look at thousands of pulsars detected since 1996, uh, 1997. Uh, we have 2,500 of them. Um, and you want to measure the breaking indexes of these objects. What is the breaking index? It is defined as omega times the second time derivative of omega divided by omega dot square. So this is a dimensionless number, but it's um, hard to measure this because of this, because the second derivative is hard to measure. Uh, it is hard to measure because although these are very good clocks, there's still some noise uh, in their spin down due to this superfluid events uh, inside. And it makes uh, it very hard to measure the second derivative. But anyway, uh, it was possible to measure it for some objects. Uh, we will see. Uh, but by the way, if this uh, magnetic dipole model is correct. Now, what you're expecting is that the breaking index uh, of pulsars should be three, because if you plug in this into here, you get three. But the measured breaking indices are as follows. For example, in the crap pulsar, you measure it to be 2.5. Uh, here are some others. You see some of them really approach three. Let's say you have a 2.8 here, 2.65, 2.7. But some of them are really, really far from being equal to three. All right. And some of them even change. All right. Look at this. This was once uh, two, then it uh, approached zero. The second most famous pulsar, Vela pulsar, has a breaking index of 1.4. And one of the objects have a breaking index exceeding three. So how is that possible? There had been some suggestions uh, why the breaking indices are generally less than three. Uh, some suggest that there's a ejection of relativistic uh, particles along with the electromagnetic waves. That is a possibility, of course. Um, some suggest that the moment of inertia of the uh, neutron stars are changing because as the star is cooling down, the superfluid region uh, in the crust is enlarged and the outer crust, which is decoupled from this, becomes uh, thinner and thinner. And so the effective moment of inertia changes in time. And uh, some suggest that the neutron star is not a point dipole. So if you consider a finite dipole, you can explain this smaller than three breaking indices. Some suggest that the inclination angle between the rotation and magnetic axis are changing. So you assumed it to be constant. So there's going to be some change due to this. And some suggest that the magnetic fields of neutron stars are growing in time. And that would also uh, change the breaking index from the estimate of three. Uh, so there could be some different reasons why the fields could grow. Uh, some suggest that thermoelectric effects lead to the growth of the field. And uh, some suggest thermomagnetic uh, processes. And some others suggest the following. 
uh, there is a rediffusion of the field to the surface after the field of the neutron star is buried by some fallback matter. Remember, the neutron star would born in a supernova explosion. And all supernova explosion simulations show that some of the matter expelled in the explosion cannot reach the escape velocity and falls back. And when it falls back, it just buries down the magnetic field of the neutron star. And then the field diffuses to the surface in time. That is just a hypothesis. And uh, these guys have suggested these. And actually, we have shown uh, uh, not very conclusive uh, uh, evidence for that in with my uh, master's student, Abdullah Güneydash. So our work is a bit of work uh, joining the observational uh, results, the breaking indices and the uh, space velocities of pulsars. So when a neutron star borns in a supernova explosion, it also gets a kick from the explosion. So we observe the neutron stars have velocities like 500 kilometers per second. So these are the space velocities. And these are very high. If you look at the progenitors of these stars, they are just moving with velocities like 30 kilometers per second. So why would they have, you know, 300 kilometers per second? Because they get a kick in the supernova explosion process. Uh, because the explosion is not spherically symmetric. Um, so if the neutron star has a high velocity, uh, then it would suffer less fallback material. And so its field would be buried at a, a lower level. And, and then the field would diffuse more rapidly. So we have related these two observations here. And it supports the rediffusion uh, of the field. Uh, but also a, a good explanation would be that um, Line et al. observed the increase in the inclination angle. That's also compelling. That could explain uh, why the breaking indices are less than three. Okay. Um, so let's look at the hydrostatic equilibrium of self-gravitating spherical objects. So you have a mass conservation equation and a hydrostatic equilibrium equation where the gravitational acceleration is gm over r squared. And so you would have an equation of state, but this equation of state is uh, relevant for ordinary stars. This is the, the gas pressure of ions and the gas pressure of the electrons and then the radiative pressure of the photons. So this is the equation of state of ordinary stars. And these two equations govern the structure. Uh, but uh, you know that uh, degeneracy would become important if the uh, particles in the star are uh, condensed into tiny regions. The first, it happens with the electrons because they, have, they would have the uh, largest de Broglie wavelengths. So when the mean separation between the particles become comparable to the de Broglie wavelength, you would have uh, the degeneracy pressure becoming important. Uh, so as a star evolves in its lifetime, its uh, core would become more compact after each nuclear reaction. For example, now the sun is burning hydrogen. It is not burning helium at the moment, right? Because the core of the sun is not sufficient for ignition of helium into carbon, right? Uh, so only after hydrogen in the core finishes, uh, the core will uh, contract 
and become hotter and and then the fusion of helium into carbon will start. Uh, so you would have a more dense core in that case. And then uh, you would have uh, the next reaction in higher mass stars and the core would become even more compact. Uh, so in for low mass stars at some stage, you cannot pass to the next reaction because the degeneracy pressure sets in before the core can uh, contract to ignite the next reaction. So here are some scaling relations. The mass conservation uh, implies that the central density would be proportional to the mass and inversely proportional to the radius Q. And hydrostatic equilibrium implies that the pressure is uh, proportional uh, to the mass squared divided by the radius to the fourth. And if you have, you know, a white dwarfs, right, which are uh, objects uh, held against gravity by their uh, electron degeneracy pressure, as first suggested by uh, Howard Fowler, uh, then uh, you would find that the uh, Fermi energy goes with the uh, number density of electrons to the power of two over three. And if uh, and then the pressure would, central pressure would go with the uh, central density to the power of five over three. And using those scaling relations, you can just see that the radius of white dwarfs uh, would be inversely proportional to their masses, and it goes with mass to the uh, power of minus one over three. So uh, a more massive white dwarf is more compact, as you see from here. Um, so uh, why is this uh, so? You can understand it from the origin of the uh, pressure, right? Electron degeneracy pressure is there because when you try to squeeze the electrons into a tiny region, the electrons start to jiggle faster, right? Uh, and so this, and this is due to quantum mechanics, basically, right? Heisenberg's principle says that if the location is well determined, the momentum is underdetermined, right? So if you have the electrons in a tiny region, uh, that means the, they would be moving uh, faster. And uh, so if you increase the mass of the object, uh, then its gravity is more. So in order to resist this gravity, uh, the star has to uh, increase the pressure. And the way to increase the pressure is to become more compact. And as you well know, Chandra Sekhar uh, in 1931 understood that if you have more massive white dwarfs, uh, then the electrons would become so rapidly moving that they would be uh, moving with, a, with some velocity close to the speed of light. And so, for example, when they are moving with the 99% of the speed of light, and if you increase the mass more, uh, the gravity increases, right? But uh, the electrons cannot go faster. It's so how can they balance the uh, gravity? So they cannot. So there is a critical maximum mass of white dwarfs. And it is a relevant number. It's 1.4 solar masses. Then the question naturally arises why, uh, what happens to stars uh, with cores exceeding 1.4 solar masses? At the time of Chandra Sekhar, he didn't have a good answer to this. He just said, one has to speculate on other possibilities. That's how his paper ends. Uh, but if you, uh, Today, we have better answers to this. Okay, now you see this Chandra Sekhar uh, limit here. 
So if you have a higher mass uh, white dwarfs, uh, then there, there would be a maximum to the mass of the white dwarfs. Uh, but before this Chandra Sekhar limit, which is reached asymptotically, takes over, there is a process, uh, the physical process, which we have to consider. This is called the neutronization. It was also understood in 1930s, right? So you know that there is a beta decay process where a neutron would decay into a proton and an electron and an antineutrino. This happens if the uh, neutron is isolated in the terrestrial conditions. And uh, in a degenerate uh, gas, uh, the reaction would be suppressed. So it doesn't happen in the nuclei. Um, now, in a neutron star or in a, in a dense uh, region, it doesn't happen easily as well. So there's an inverse process of this, where an electron would uh, meet with a proton and would produce a neutron and a neutrino, right? So uh, this process would lead to the uh, taken away of the electrons in the white dwarf if the core of the white dwarfs become uh, too dense or more massive, right? So the electrons uh, would be very relativistic and they would tend to uh, merge with the protons to form neutrons. But remember that pressure was produced by the electrons. So if the electrons are converting to neutrons, then, uh, you know, you, you don't have much pressure. So you increasing the mass of the object, but the pressure is decreasing, this is an unstable situation. Uh, so this brings the uh, upper mass of uh, white dwarfs, actually. Um, if you can do this uh, in a ultra relativistic uh, case for a pro proton, electron, neutron gas, you would find that as a beta equilibrium case where the uh, electrons uh, one unit, protons are one unit, so for charge equilibrium, that's, that should be the case, but the neutrons would be dominating, uh, so they are eight times larger than protons and electrons. So here we see why we would have neutron stars, but of course the neutron star is not a gas of electron, proton, neutron, they have a iron uh, nuclei there. Uh, but you can see that the nuclei would be uh, neutron dominated. Uh, so this is not a situation you meet in the terrestrial conditions. In the terrestrial conditions, you find that the number of neutrons and protons are almost the same, right? So the effect of neutronization on the mass radius relation of white dwarfs were studied here. Now, there is another thing we should consider when we are reaching these maximums. That's the uh, relativistic corrections to the hydrostatic equilibrium. In general relativity, uh, the hydrostatic equilibrium has corrections. These 1 plus p over rho c squared is a relativistic correction. The other terms are also relativistic corrections. In Newtonian gravity, you only have this one. Okay, uh, the mass equation doesn't change, but this is just on the form. In, uh, in, in, in the reality, actually, uh, this is not a, a spherical, uh, in, in general relativity, the, the spherical shell would be described rather differently. Of course. Okay. Um, so which our, whichever comes first, uh, GR instability or beta instability? Well, GR is also causing instability. Let's under try to understand this. Um, now, in Newtonian gravity, you see that the pressure gradient balances the gravity of the object, right? But you see that in general relativity, 
you have pressure on the right hand side contributing to the gravity this is understandable because in general relativity all forms of energy contribute to the gravity so pressure is a form of energy right because it's just a random motion of the particles so if the star is squeezing and it's increasing its pressure to balance gravity uh, then uh, there could be a limit where the pressure is uh, so high that it's actually increasing the gravity and so this ends the, the static equilibrium of the star so uh, it depends on the chemical composition whichever comes first in some cases uh, general relativity uh, instability would come first and in some cases the uh, beta instability would come first so it was studied in rotondo et al so in hydrostatic equilibrium there could be two uh, uh, static equilibrium um, so the white dwarf case where the radius is larger so this is the stable branch here and for the neutron stars you would go here so this is an unstable branch it's not realized in nature so um, white doors are uh, some stability region and neutron stars and another stability region um, also, we should see that there's a phenomena called neutron drip because as more neutrons are created in the nuclei, the energy levels for the neutrons get filled up to an energy level equal to the mass of the neutron uh, times the C square. And uh, at this point, any electron that penetrates the nucleus will create a neutron which doesn't tend to stay in the nucleus, but tends to drip out of the nucleus. So we call this the neutron drip limit. And from this onwards, uh, the neutrons, uh, the density of neutrons freely uh, available increases. And eventually, as you go deeper in the neutron star, all the neutrons would drip out of the nuclei and uh, we would have a totally neutron fluid interior of the star and this is how the density distribution goes you see it's changing by 15 orders of magnitude near the crust and this is how the pressure goes and these are the equation of state so we have an akmal pandra handi equ equation of state let's we assumed uh, for the solution. We don't know the exact equation of state in the center, by the way. And this is Negalev Water equation of state in the inner crust, and Bein Pedic and Switzerland equation of state in the outer crust. So this would be the mass distribution in the star. So near the crust, it would be somewhat constant. And this is the total mass versus total radius uh, for different equation of state. So there's a huge plethora of equations of state which make different assumptions about the composition of the star and the interaction of the nucleons. So you have different mass radius relations resulting from this. Uh, but there are some constraints on them. For example, uh, there's, there's two solar mass object detected. So any uh, equation of state should be producing, should be able to produce neutron stars with masses exceeding this observed mass. For example, this equation of state, MS1, or this equation of state, FSU, would have trouble with this observation because the maximum mass attained with this equation of state is less than two solar masses. But already we have observed 
a neutron star with a two solar mass. So uh, this, this favors these equations of state. But still, we have many equations of state about two solar masses. So uh, which of them is correct? So we, we should also be measuring the radius of the neutron star. And this is a bit hard to do. And this is how this was observed. Anyway, um, here are some observations by uh, Guver et al. And they are placing constraints also on the radius of a neutron star. And uh, so these are their measurements. So they show that uh, this 10 kilometer is a reasonable uh, radius. Um, so uh, these equations of states uh, were calculated, or these ones were calculated, assuming that uh, general relativity is the uh, final word on classical relativistic theory of gravity, okay? Uh, but you know that there are other uh, theories of gravity which are relativistic, and they can uh, make reasonable predictions about the solar system, uh, but the predictions for neutron stars could be different, okay? Um, so, uh, neutron stars could be used for testing these, of course. Uh, but still, general relativity presents us the fundamental framework uh, for understanding gravity. We, uh, you know this, uh, of course, very well. Um, the uh, existence of black holes, the uh, Hubble expansion of the galaxies, and uh, many other observations are compatible uh, with the predictions of general relativity. But I'd like to show you this graph. Um, SS is the solar system, okay? So most of the best uh, tests of general relativity were made in the solar system. And here on this graphics, um, the x-axis is the compactness which is gm over the radius times c square. So how compact the objects are. So, so the solar system, in the solar system, the compactness is given here. But the compactness of neutron stars is about five orders of magnitude larger. And the y-axis is the curvature. Okay, so the, it means that the curvature, space-time curvature, in a neutron star would be some 14 orders of magnitude larger than the solar system. Okay, so any theory of uh, relativistic gravity which can make uh, similar predictions with GR at the... Uh, you know, weak field limit can have different predictions for, uh, you know, the systems of neutron stars where the curvature is much higher. Uh, so the strongest field solar system tests would be probing compactnesses like 10 to the minus six and curvatures like 10 to the minus 12, uh, 28. And you see these Hall-Stater and neutron stars, Hall-Stater pulsar, they are so separated from each other. And neutron stars and black holes. Okay, the LIGO experiments would be, uh, are occupying this region. Yeah. Um, now, in a neutron star, you'd have compactnesses five orders of magnitude larger and curvatures 15 orders of magnitude larger. And you see, remember, these are relativistic objects. Okay, so these are all 
relativistic corrections, the colored ones. Uh, so we can use neutron stars to find deviations from uh, general relativity, or at least we can uh, put limits on such theories by using neutron stars, the observed parameters of neutron stars. For example, uh, you know that the uh, FR, there's a bunch of theories called FR theories. One of these would have a function like R plus alpha R square. So alpha equals zero is the case of general relativity. Okay, and so let's assume there is a correction to this uh, theory where, you know, uh, you, assuming this is uh, R is just, a, you know, FR is a, just a series uh, and we have just added one more term from the series. And uh, so uh, how, how large could alpha be if, you know, GR is a, uh, limit of such a theory. And actually, we have made this calculation uh, some uh, 10 years ago, and uh, we have placed limits on alpha, as you see here, um, with my colleagues uh, in Istanbul Technical University. Actually, they are string theorists, and this theory is somewhat motivated by string theory, where uh, the constant there, of course, would have uh, dimensions at the order of Planck units, so it's insignificant. But let's assume that it's just any constant. So how large this constant could be? That was the question we asked. And we have found that it should be less than 10 to the 10 centimeter square. And someone else uh, from uh, by using uh, gravity probe B data put constraints uh, on the same value uh, as large as 5 times 10 to the 15 centimeters square. So our value uh, for our constraint is much more tight uh, simply because we are using neutron stars, right? which is very, very dense object compared to the Earth. Uh, uh, we have also put some limits on another theory where there's another uh, correction term, r mu nu, r mu nu. Uh, so this is the uh, Ricci tensor, uh, contractions of the uh, Ricci tensor. Okay. Uh, now, there are three different curvatures in general relativity. Uh, actually, they are a measure for tidal forces, but uh, because tidal force is the only sign of gravity that cannot be cast aside by a coordinate transformation. Uh, so uh, the tidal force of a body moving along a geodesic could lead to a distortion of the shape of the body and a change in the volume of the body. So we have different curvatures in uh, general relativity and in relativistic theories of gravity. Uh, the Riemann curvature tensor captures both of them. The Ricci curvature uh, only captures the trace component of the uh, Riemann tensor and it only conveys the second one, the change in the volume of the body. And the Weyl tensor, which is the traceless component of the Riemann tensor, conveys the information of only the first one, a distortion of the shape of the body while the volume is constant. So related to these, we have constructed these uh, curvature scalars. This J square is R mu nu, R mu nu. So K square is uh, the Riemann uh, curvatures, uh, uh, mu nu rho sigma, mu nu rho sigma, and then uh, we have calculated them in inside the neutron star. So these all these three different curvatures we have constructed, and then we have looked at how they are inside the neutron star, and we see that the curvature 
inside the neutron star is still very large. One would expect that, um, you know, as you go inside, the mass uh, contained in a uh, radius of r would become smaller, and so the gravity would become smaller. But as the radius is smaller, the uh, curvature increases, because the smaller the radius, higher is the curvature. Uh, so the catch is that uh, even at the you know, very center of the neutron star, you have very strong curvature, which is beyond uh, what is probed in the solar system tests. Uh, so this is uh, another, uh, you know, this is a study suggesting that when you measure the mass and radius of a neutron star, you're not actually putting constraints on the equation of state, you're actually putting constraints on uh, the gravity theories. And actually, I think I should stop here. If you have any questions, I would like to answer those questions. Yeah, thank you, sir. So we have some questions. So we can discuss in our uh, discussion session also. Mm -hmm. So uh, which one you prefer? OK, sure. Uh, now I uh, see some people ask uh, for the presentation slides. Well, you can write me emails. Of course, you can find me on, uh, you know, uh, Googling my name and I would send them. Uh, I can add the question in the screen. Mm -hmm. You can see in the screen. Uh, some day ago, added. they published a news in Astrophysical Journal that that was the dimming of battle Guiz star, Hubble Space Telescope gave a reason behind this. Mainly it was due to outburst of that star. Uh, my question is, what's the main reason of outburst? Well, whatever the reason, I think it's not related to neutron stars and I don't know why uh, this star shows the battle quiz. We are expecting that battle quiz will explode as a supernova explosion in the future, but we don't know when, right? But the deeming uh, of it at the moment is something I don't know why. Okay, we have another question. So as we told that the white dwarf uh, will be more compact uh, when mass increases, how could mass be increased in any sphere? Um, mass yeah, uh, the density also increases. Uh, but I'm talking about the uh, increase in the uh, mass. Actually, I explained it in my talk. Um, the reason is the origin of pressure, right? The origin of the pressure is due to the uh, electrons being squeezed in a tiny region. They are jiggling faster, right? This is a quantum mechanical phenomena. So if you increase the mass, you're increasing the gravity of the object. So in order to balance the gravity, the object should uh, increase the pressure. And so in order to increase the pressure, it would squeeze the electrons in a, a more tiny region than the previous one. So if you have a white dwarf, uh, which is accreting matter from a companion, as the mass of the white dwarf is increasing in this process, uh, it will become smaller and smaller and denser and denser. So maybe we yeah, have right. another question, the same person. Mm -hmm. when, any uh, when any star becomes white dwarf or neutron star, then is there any change in the space-time curvature? Yes, uh, you know, the uh, original star has a very small curvature and compactness, but when it becomes a white dwarf and a neutron star, the compactness increases by five orders of magnitude when it becomes a neutron star, and the curvature increases by 15 orders of magnitude. And we haven't tested, actually, general relativity at such curvatures yet. Thank you, sir. So the, mm -hmm. this may be the last question. 
so we can assume from the radius of an exploding star which element would uh, be generated at most. So backwards, we can also calculate from the exploded stars their radius from the element density in uh, space. Well, we can uh, find the element density in space, but it, it would not be very easy to go to the radius of the uh, progenitor star from the elements, but astronomers can really uh, estimate what type of star has uh, exploded uh, and at what stage it, it was. I mean, all these elements, for example, did it produce iron yet or not? Right, they can do this. Okay, maybe uh, this is mm -hmm. the question up to now. Of course. So maybe you can continue. So maybe uh, somebody have connected. So I'm asking uh, if you interested to join, you can join uh, uh, Mr. Shovik Brahma. So can you hear me? If you have any question, you can ask. Hello, Mr. Shovik. Okay, maybe uh, he's not connected with us. So, uh, thank you, sir. I thank for you your for nice your invitation presentation. again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think uh, a student have uh, learned a lot of things and uh, actually we have also learned a lot of things and uh, uh, we are very grateful to you because uh, we know that you are too busy with your... It, it was a real uh, pleasure for me. Uh, pandemic uh, in your... Yes. Uh. <laughs> it's my pleasure and privilege to host you. And I'd like to say thanks on the behalf of the Department of Physics of my University of Science and Technology. So, sir, if you are free, so we'll arrange another program in near of future. Course. So, for our mm -hmm. student. Uh, so, so, so thanks, uh, thanks for everything, sir, for your support, for your cooperation, and uh, it's really a pleasure, sir, to uh, do a webinar with you. Goodbye. So, goodbye for today, and, and hopefully we. We'll and greetings here, from Turkey, in, near future. and Istanbul, so, and best wishes yeah, yeah. from our department. Yeah, yeah. Thank, uh, thank you for the invitation again. Yeah, yeah. And uh, see. It's a pleasure. Maybe this is the first uh, international webinar with any Bangladeshi uh, university. Yes, it is uh, my is first. It, sir? Okay, so it's, it's our pleasure. Yeah, it's, it's really our pleasure and we feel uh, really prou proud to Thank host you. you. And thanks again. So hopefully we'll uh, see sure. you again very soon. Bye-bye. So bye for today.